going to give, give a bit of an overview and have some conceptual discussions also about uh, sensory co-stimulation effects, about causal interpretation of um, NIPS and brain imaging data. Um, but I will mainly focus on the combination of um, uh, uh, NIPS with EG imaging. Uh, we're briefly introducing also the idea of combining it with fMRI, but uh, since Christopher Metzen is going to give a talk afterwards, I am going to uh, be a bit short on that one. So um, what are the general approaches available for this? Um, the easiest one would be just to um, correlate uh, results from imaging or electrophysiology uh, with the uh, evoked induced NIPS effects across sessions, so to look at inter-individual um, uh, inter correlations, or within a session, to look at actually intra-individual correlations across trials also. Another option is to use imaging um, to inform brain stimulation, to decide where to stimulate as in function localizers, when to stimulate based on um, timing of evoked components, how to stimulate, maybe deriving the frequency uh, of the um, individual alpha oscillation to um, um, optimize TACS. And again, this can be done uh, across sessions with a consecutive um, approach or concurrently, if we actually want to use the ongoing um, information for our brain stimulation approach. I'm going to come back to that at the end of the talk. And then finally, in this um, larger part of this talk, uh, the idea to uh, use new imaging and electrophysiology as readouts for non-invasive brain stimulation effects. And again, if you apply it consecutively, you can look at the after effects of offline brain stimulation um, approaches to measure the, the impact of producing synaptic uh, plastic effects. Um, but then you can also apply it concurrently and look at the immediate effects of online brain stimulation. And if you combine the last two um, options, then you can actually close the loop uh, into brain state dependent brain stimulation um, uh, inform your stimulation by imaging, stimulating, and using the readout of the stimulation effects again. And I'll also come back to that in the very end. So when we um, use non-invasive neuroimaging techniques, um, we can usually cover a certain um, uh, temporal and spatial range uh, in, in human research. We can combine, for example, EEG and fMRI to get the good um, temporal and spatial resolution of the two techniques combined. But uh, as we all know, to, to make causal claims about what neural activity does, uh, we want to uh, use uh, non-based brain stimulation techniques like TMS and, and TS, and uh, now also upcoming uh, um, transcranial ultrasound stimulation. And luckily, we can combine all those techniques with new imaging. Um, and we can do so offline, that's relatively easy. I'm not going to go into that. There are a few caveats, but um, still, you do one after the other. But if you want to combine them um, simultaneously, which is possible for most of those techniques, then it gets a bit tricky. Um, I mean, you won't fit a TMS call in an image, but otherwise, most of these things are possible. Um, but let me briefly go back to this idea of causation. Um, because usually we, we try to infer causality from non-invasive brain stimulation studies, cognitive neuroscience. And what you read are often very simplified, oversimplified um, hypotheses, arguing that uh, we're applying non-invasive brain stimulation to uh, change neural activity in region X, and this is changing then um, behavior recognition. But actually, there are a lot of implicit assumptions, right? So we apply NIPS, which produces an uh, effect of sufficient strength in our target region, which is then causing local effects, which either directly or via remote network effects causes changes in the computation, so cognitive function, and eventually the changes to the performance and behavioral task that's meant to operationalize and measure this cognitive function. So this entire causal chain of events uh, has to work out for our conclusion to be correct. But there are a lot of potential confounds, right? We could co-stimulate other non-target regions, whose local and remote effects affect other cognitive functions, attention, working memory, they're supporting, or actually the cognitive function of interest. We could actually um, produce peripheral co-stimulation effects. TMS makes a click, you feel it on the skin. Um, TACS gives you phosphine sometimes, and uh, or tingling sensation on the skin anyway. So there is a lot that can produce 
uh, sensory evoked and induced activity in the brain, which again interacts with the neural activity of interest in the cognitive function. And then there are a lot of other um, uh, things like task demands, brain state, etc., that also affect those um, steps. So, how do we actually go all the way from here to there? Uh, since most of those variables are actually um, latent and, and hidden. And for, for the E fields, we can do simulations. For the neural activity, we can actually use new imaging, and this is what I'm talking about today, to try and see what's actually happening in the brain when we're stimulating. And as uh, Giza has pointed out yesterday in, in a talk, um, that one can use models uh, in the cognitive and um, behavioral domain to get, get a, bit of, a better handle on, on the outcome functions. So let's look into neural imaging here. And uh, I want to briefly highlight the possibility of combining TMS and fMRI concurrently because we've uh, been establishing this uh, in our lab during the last year, put a lot of effort into this. Just published a, a review paper which really goes into a detail about all the methods. I'm just going to fly over that superficially here because uh, Christopher Madsen might be going to way more detail. So what you need is an uh, MR-compatible um, TMS machine, uh, which reduces some leakage, uh, a low-pass filter to make sure that there's no noise getting into the uh, chamber via the very long extension of your uh, TMS coil cable, and if specific MR-compatible coils, and possibly even specific TMS-compatible MR coils, and you need to time your stimulation in between volumes or in between slices actually to prevent artifacts um, in the imaging data. So these are how our setup in minds looks like. Uh, so uh, we use these um, seven channel RF coils. Uh, two of them have been developed by Navarro de Lara in Christian uh, Winnischberger's lab in Vienna. Um, and we can actually stimulate through those very thin coils. Um, are getting very good signal at least uh, at the stimulation site itself uh, with online new navigation and it's a bit tricky but possible to that the the tracker are still visible while the uh, participant is in the scanner and so with an online monitoring of pole position throughout the entire um, session uh, it's a bit of an effort to establish so why should we do that what are the opportunities um, and the main one is mainly that you can actually look at and uh, you can map, map the neural responses and map effective connectivity based on the stimulation. So when you look at the TMS evolved fault response at your um, initial target site, but also in connected brain regions, you can um, provide a proof of target engagement for those regions, which you usually cannot, right? For the motor cortex, it's easy. There's an MEP for the visual cortex and phosphine. Otherwise, it gets tricky. And um, here we can actually show also for connected deep brain regions, uh, um, whether or not we get uh, a new response uh, to the stimulation. And we can also systematically try out different stimulation intensities and optimize um, uh, the coil orientation, for example, possibly also preparing that to um, EFIT simulations, would be extremely interesting to see um, which of those parameters actually provide the strongest response. So we can actually optimize empirically uh, our stimulation to stimulate, uh, so to activate the target region of interest, which could also be a connected uh, deep brain region. And also we can um, study the interaction of TMS with task-related um, phosphatase brain activity, so looking at state dependency. And there are numerous studies that have been shown uh, that um, the TMS evoked fault response also in, in the entire network depends on what the subject is doing at the time of stimulation. Um, so it's extremely important also for interpreting results of your cognitive neuroscience, uh, NIPS behavioral studies to know which brain regions were actually activated because it's not only at the target site, it's always an entire network activation. And so you might want to check out the activation of which region is actually predicting the behavior changes uh, we produce. And along the same lines, uh, concurrent imaging can also help you to uncover uh, sensory confounds um, 
like in the UVT activation, the auditory cortex from the TMS clear QVT activation. So the sensory cortex may be from the sensations on the skin, um, but there's also expectancy effects, et cetera, that are depending on the um, experimental design. So in, uh, in some, it helps you to actually open the black box and see what you did to the brain of the stimulation and what could you actually expect uh, to actually predict the behavioral effects you observe. Now, changing gears, uh, actually going to faster techniques, um, uh, because FMI has great uh, um, special resolution and good sensitivity for deep brain regions, but uh, to study, for example, brain oscillations, it is just too slow. So there we want to rely on EEG and MEG, for example. And um, I'm not going into all the artifacts, because I could talk in the entire day about that. Um, if you're interested, there's an upcoming book chapter in the new uh, um, second edition of the Oxford Handbook. Um, we we'll really go into detail uh, on all the different TMS artifacts and um, uh, TDCS, TACS artifacts in EEG and MEG. Um, so we can deal with most of them post hoc, often processing for TMS. Uh, for TACS, it's a bit more difficult actually to get through those massive artifacts um, to the actual data online. Um, but what I'm rather want to talk about are those um, not artifactual, but actually still biological effects, uh, actually even still uh, cortical effects produced by uh, sensory co stimulation. And we had this paper in collaboration with um, uh, Hartwig Siebners in, in our Sikishas group on uh, realistic sham uh, TMSG. So using a, a setup where we do stimulate with the same intensity or adjusted intensity uh, uh, to produce a TMS click, like for real TMS EG, and at the same time stimulate uh, where surface electrodes the, the skin to produce also a continuous sensation. Um, we could actually show that the TMS evoked um, potentials, and here the global mean field power, they look very similar to real TMS. So real team has um, evoked EG potentials. The spatial and temporal correlation is pretty high, at least for the later components. Um, and this sparked quite a heated, uh, but very healthy debate uh, on co-stimulation compounds in the community. Um, and I would like to say that it's, I mean, there's definitely consensus that there are truly transcranially evoked EG potentials, right? Uh, but at the same time, for a lot of experiments, a lot of uh, setups, there's actually also um, uh, multi sensory evoked potentials that are um, entangled with a true uh, transcranial evoked potential. And that's a problem, and we, we have to deal with that actively. And I suggest that we deal um, with it via good experimental design and um, appropriate control conditions. So for GMS, we have this click sound to induce an auditory evoke potentials, um, we're stimulating cranial nerves and muscles, um, uh, so cranial muscles, uh, producing small sensory evoke responses. Um, for TDCS, the ACS, we have retinal stimulation, which in phosphine is continuous stimulation, uh, producing skin sensations, vestibular stimulation, even sometimes producing vertigo. Uh, and all this is affecting brain activity. Even at subthreshold intensities, when you still um, when you cannot feel it anymore, cannot see for screens anymore, it doesn't mean your brain is not processing subconsciously these um, stimuli. So what we can do is, for TMS FMI, for example, use noise masking, foam padding to attenuate this, uh, at least the conscious perception. Um, we can use realistic sham, uh, include both auditory and somatic sensory stimulation. For TCS, TACS, centers round montages, uh, tend to prevent or reduce for feeling perception. Um, uh, Quite effectively, and on top we can also use to, uh, topical anesthesia like this Emla cream to attenuate skin sensations, for example. But most importantly, we need active control sites or active control montages, so stimulating the brain at a different region to show anatomical specificity of the results while controlling as good as possible for all the uh, co-stimulation components. And we still have to show that our control condition or um, realistic sham is, is matching properly the sensations of the subject. Now, after this um, methodological round, <laughs> uh, going a bit into a few examples of 
what we've done, uh, combining um, TMS and uh, TS with uh, EG and MEG to study uh, oscillations. And just briefly, uh, just um, for the background, this, this idea of, uh, of alpha oscillations being an um, asymmetric inhibitory oscillation. So with increasing amplitude, there's increasing inhibition and shorter duty cycles where actually information processing can occur, where alpha, um, so where uh, gamma oscillations um, occur that reflect bottom-up sensory processing, for example. And most likely based on um, frontal uh, top-down control, we can modulate then um, the expression of these alpha oscillations, let's say in the visual cortex, um, upregulating this inhibitory oscillation um, uh, for task irrelevant brain regions while downregulating um, for task relevant regions and making thereby the uh, and guiding thereby the information flow in the brain. Um, so there's one uh, TCS imagery study uh, where we try to test whether um, there's an actual modulation, uh, a phase modulation of uh, usually induced gamma oscillations um, in the alpha range. So the participants sat in the MEG and were um, looking at these uh, high contrast inward movement ratings, which produces a strong gamma response in the visual cortex. Uh, at the center was an, a small asterisk rotating in one or the other direction, which they had to detect to keep them on task. And um, a few seconds before we switched on the visual stimulus, we switched on TSES. Um, and we did so either of the um, of the civil cortex, so the standard uh, ZZ OZ montage, or uh, with the retinal control montage, FPZ, ZZ, um, to induce uh, currents in the retina predominantly. So we titrated both to 80% um, of the respective um, phosphine threshold, so they didn't see phosphines, but um, we were at a similar level below threshold for the retina in both cases. Um, and then we also stimulated individual alpha frequency or um, four hertz below or above the frequency to see whether we get a frequency specific response as you would expect from actual entrainment of an ongoing oscillation. And with sham trials, everything was intermingled. So, what you see here is the typical gamma uh, response to occipital um, uh, uh, to visual stimulation, um, uh, which is present during the entire presentation of the visual stimulus. And uh, during occipital TSES, compared to SHAM, you can see that this reduced, while well, it's not reduced, compared um, to retinal stimulation. So there's a general reduction of visually induced gamma power during TSES of the occipital cortex. When we then cut the individual um, cycles into snippets and look at the TFR here, then you see at this frequency of the usually induced gamma response, that there's no difference from the uniform distribution in CHAM in the original control, but there's a clear modulation um, in the occipital stimulation condition. And specifically, it is a rhythmic suppression um, of the uh, usually induced gamma response. That was actually evident for all frequencies. So there's no frequency specific response. Um, we found an effect on behavior that is when stimulating the occipital cortex, the detection of these asterisk rotations was impaired, also for, um, independent of the frequency. But the stronger the TACS phase to, to gamma power modulation, phase amplitude modulation, the stronger was this behavioral impairment. Um, so we could show at least that um, we can entrain excitability to occipital cortex transcranially, so it's not written with the cortical entrainment, uh, which you rule out of the control condition, uh, that is behaviorally relevant. Well, it might not be entrainment of an actual alpha oscillation because it also works for neighboring frequencies. The other study is also targeting um, uh, these occipital alpha oscillations, but this time with TMS EG. And the question was um, whether the occipital response at alpha frequency that we usually see when we stimulate the visual cortex with TMS, um, whether this is actually alpha or just an evoked response. And when we use RTMS to entrain, let's say alpha in the visual cortex, and we see 
some alpha-like response? Is it just a concatenation of revoked responses or is it actually alpha that being trained? So if it's real alpha, it should also behave like alpha, which means it should be modulated by top-down attention in the same way. And attention is decreasing alpha. Um, well, unattention, or paying attention to a different modality would um, be increasing alpha. So subject did a, a cross-modal attention task here, uh, seeing visual noise here, auditory noise in the future, either streamed um, for a few um, minutes uh, to detect small changes here. Uh, and at the same time, we stimulated the left visual cortex in a position where we could induce phosphines, which we didn't here because we used 90% uh, phosphine threshold. Um, but just to show that we are stimulating actually the visual cortex. And as a control, we stimulated intermingled here um, as sham the left shoulder bay. And uh, we adjusted the position and intensity in a way that subjectively uh, it felt similar to the participants in terms of intensity and it sounded similar. Um, so the stimulation side left uh, visual cortex, we saw an attentional modulation of um, spontaneous alpha oscillations, showing that we are, uh, we're at a spot where attention actually has an effect on alpha in principle. And I'm first looking at the TMS evoked EG potential. So just um, time lock to the TMS pulse. And in green and, and black, you see the evoked response to the shoulder simulation. And in blue and red, um, to actually uh, oxygen cortex TMS. And they look very similar, right? I mean, there are a lot of overlapping components. And this was actually the result that also triggered the, the Conley study, because I thought, okay, obviously it's pretty easy to get similar components uh, in the EEG by not even stimulating the brain at all. But there are also components that are definitely only there um, for TMS, and they're also located at the stimulation side. So this N40, for example, um, is in the left stimulated visual cortex, and it's modulated by attention positively. That is, um, it is larger when um, attention is paid to the visual screen instead of the auditory screen. So most likely because the occipital cortex excitability is increased by attention, this uh, is, is modulated. But then we actually looked after the time period when we have all these evoked components uh, and you don't see much here in the group average, but at the senior subject, you see quite an echo, quite an, um, a time locked auditory response at the um, uh, stimulation side. It just doesn't have the same frequency for subject and average out of the group level. But during the time frequency representation of these um, individual time locked averages, you see uh, a long lasting um, alpha uh, response, low alpha at the stimulation site, which is modulated by attention, and it's larger uh, during low than during high attention. So it behaves like alpha should behave, but it's TMS locked. Um, it's not there for sham, and there's a significant interaction. So basically, we, we show that uh, in principle, with TMS, we may produce oscillatory responses that behave very similar to a spontaneous oscillatory response of the same frequency. So it might be tapping into the same circuit, producing them. Now, for the rest of my talk, I'm um, um, uh, going to focus on brain state dependent brain stimulation. So what does that mean? Usually we've been treating the, the brain as a black box. Um, so we disregard what the brain is doing at the time of stimulation and we get pretty large variability in our outcome measures, for example, in the If we would take the brain as the dynamic system it actually is, we might see that um, uh, when sorting according to brain state, we get very different responses, and they may or may not be more homogeneous in their variability. So, so what we've doing so far is just triggering an open loop brain state independent brain stimulation the stimulator at any time. What we're doing at the moment is open loop still, but brain state dependent brain stimulation. So we uh, read out a certain aspect of brain state. Uh, EG um, for the real time um, to see and then trigger the, the stimulator. And what we would like to do in the future is to read out uh, a brain state, change the parameters, stimulate, and then actually change the brain state. So change the parameter we're monitoring. That's the definition of a closed loop system. But I want to give you at least uh, an example of 
the open loop brains, the dependent brains, the matching code, because this is already a, a pretty powerful um, tool. So again, alpha oscillations, but this time sensory motor cortex. So the mu alpha you heard from uh, Stephen Jones uh, earlier. And um, we've asked whether we do actually see asymmetric pulse inhibition as for the occipital cortex, so that with increasing amplitude, there would be phase angles where there's strong inhibition of the MEP in the motor cortex, but there are also phase angles where there's no inhibition and it would be at the same state as um, um, during a desynchronized low amplitude state. Or whether it's asymmetric pulse facilitation, so whether with high amplitude, they're increasing bounds of facilitation, increasing the MEP, but other phase angles for this high uh, amplitude oscillations are still at the same level as in the desynchronized state, or maybe it's even symmetric. So we targeted with our real-time EG trig MS system, um, the lower and the upper 20% of the individual mu power distribution, so mu alpha power. Uh, so the lower 20% are basically desynchronized. There's no um, phase um, visible. The upper 20% are actually um, uh, fully blown um, alpha oscillations, and we can target specifically the peak, the falling flank, the trough, or the rising flank. And we measured single pulse MEPs as a measure of cortical spinal excitability and um, a paired pulse short intercortical inhibition uh, as a measure of couple of aergic inhibitory surveys. Just showing that we hit the right states, so show a high amplitude and low amplitude um, trials. You also uh, was in the TFR, tap and zero was stimulated. Here, um, the um, topography of the uh, mu alpha power at the time of stimulation. So it's really sensory motor uh, location not bleeding in from occipital alpha, for example. And we hit the right phase. So at random, so it averages out here in that condition or the peak, the falling flank, the trough, or the rising flank. And what did we find? Compared to this baseline, this mu, so it's normalized across all of them, but it, um, the baseline conceptually is the low amplitude desynchronized condition. And during the peak and falling flank, there's no difference, but there's an increase, a relative increase during the trough and rising flank. So it's pulse facilitation, not inhibition happening in M1. Might be different in S1, but in M1 where we measure excitability, it's that direction. There's no effect in SSCI. Um, and in a different study, we could show that also there's a positive relationship, weak but positive, between the power, because we targeted into the power bins of the central motor mu alpha and um, motor cortical excitability. So this is a bit opposed to what we would expect from the small sensing in the visual cortex. And I'm happy to speculate later about uh, why that might be, but that's um, uh, what we found. And this has been used um, on the principal idea by um, uh, colleagues in tubing uh, who actually repetitively targeted the, the trough or the peak and uh, different sessions uh, with 100 hertz triplets of TMS. And when targeting the more excitable trough repetitively, there was an LTP like increase in excitability afterwards, which was absent when repetitively targeting the same number of stimuli, the less excitable um, peak. So this might be a case of phase dependent plasticity, similar to um, what uh, Simon Hansemeyer has described um, in his talk yesterday. And um, so providing input, high frequency input at um, more excitable states of an oscillation might mimic the phase amplitude coupling that we see, for example, during slow oscillations of spindles or um, theta to gamma coupling. So eventually we would like to close the loop. And um, to facilitate this, I just want to, um, uh, to highlight the uh, open source MATLAB um, toolbox that my PhD student, my son, has written um, the Brain Electrophysiological Recording and Stimulation, so the best toolbox. Um, again, the acronym came first and then the name, of course. So this toolbox allows to um, automate um, a lot of processes uh, we usually have in the brain stimulation lab, um, especially for TMS research, but also um, for uh, focus ultrasound, also for, for TTCFT ACS. Um, so this toolbox sits in between um, a lot of recording equipment, so it's compatible with a lot of EG and EMG amplifiers, um, and also uh, general um, field trip buffers. And you can uh, configure and trigger 
um, certain stimulators, uh, different uh, DMS machines, uh, 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 force ultrasound machine, um, actually everything that can be triggered by, by a TTL pulse. And we're currently also integrating it with a, a robotized new navigation uh, system. So currently, you can do um, closed loop threshold hunting, input output curves, um, um, paired pulse, and dual coil studies, whatever you like. All of that also in a brain state dependent fashion. So depending on the um, frequency and amplitude of your um, uh, pet oscillation. And if you're interested with our website, there are more details, also some YouTube tutorials. We also have a, um, a webinar on that soon where we give an introduction to the toolbox. The, the good thing is it allows you to actually record um, data, save the data um, in a standardized fashion, which you can share across labs. You can design um, and execute experiments and share those experiment files uh, across labs. So I hope it will contribute to producing more objective, more reliable uh, NIPS experiment results in the future. So with that, I'd like to thank my lab members and apologize for going a bit over time. Thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you Theo. Um, a lot of excitement development on combination of brain stimulation and uh, imaging. And we have a few questions from participants. Uh, first, do you have a good strategy for getting bold responses under the TMS coil? Good strategy. Um, well, there are several reasons why you sometimes get a bold response and sometimes not, right? Um, and we discussed most of them uh, that we could come up with in, in this new review paper. One is that, uh, for standard setups, you have your um, TMS coil in between the MR coil and the head. So uh, while it's MR compatible, it's still um, interfering and might reduce sensitivity. Um, those um, surface poles that can be um, sandwiched between head and TMS coil um, provide, according to the respective publications, uh, and signal to noise increase, uh, and that's about fivefold. Um, at the depth of about three centimeters, so in the cortex. They have lower SNR for deep brain regions, uh, but I, I expect that um, Christopher is going to comment a bit on that as well. Um, so it, it could just be that you don't see it because the MR code is not sensitive. Um, it could also be that you're producing mainly firing, but your bolt signal is uh, sensitive to a perisynaptic activity, right? So. Um, you earlier see activation in connected brain regions than in the region you, you stimulate. But then again, we expect uh, already within the cortex, the, the, the stimulation to be transsynaptic, right? And it, it involves multiple neurons. So most likely there is also um, some uh, perisynaptic activity going on and you should see both together. Um, and um, so far, uh, for most studies, we needed um, super threshold intensities to start seeing both signal at the stimulation side. Um, for the motor cortex, where as for any other NIPS research, most of the research has been conducted, there's of course a confound, right? You stimulate uh, at um, super threshold intensities, and you get an MEP, you get a muscle twitch, you get sensory feedback, which is also evoking both response in the sensor motor cortex. Um, so, so actually what we're doing at the moment, and uh, maybe, uh, later this year, we'll be able to show some some data. Is to to block the feedback by an um, ischemic nerve block, and see whether we then still see a uh, bolt response in the motor cortex, even though there's no feedback from the muscles getting back to the uh, motor cortex at super pressure intensities. Um, so long story short, there are different reasons why you may or may not see a response at the stimulation side directly. Oh yeah, one interesting one is also uh, you might not stimulate where you thought you, you were stimulating. So either you were just slightly off target because you didn't do online new navigation, for example, or um, you would find doing effect modeling that your strongest field actually slightly elsewhere than expected, right? And then this might be the place where you uh, should see the board response. And we'd be very excited to, to look into that in the future. <clears throat> 